You're listening to The Real Deal. This is the new JFK Show number 68. Our research team consists of Don Fox, Larry Rivera, Dr. Jim Fetzer, and myself. And we're here to bring you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and help you steer clear of the disinformation. And my God, there is so much disinformation out there. It's mind-boggling, but we've got a guy that knows how to cut through it. His name is Don Fox. Welcome to the show, Don. Hey, thanks for having me back, Gary. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're ready for another one. Uh, What was the last one, Permindex? Yeah, and in fact, now I found an article here from Dean Henderson. This appeared on, it's on the uh, nodisinfo.com website. Who killed JFK? Evidence points to Mossad. All right. This is excerpted from uh, Dean's book. Okay. Chapter 9, uh, the Texas Oil Mafia, Big Oil and Their Bankers. Uh, All, right. All right. Before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about why this is going to be a JFK show, because it actually sounds more like the weekend report by the time we get halfway through. So, <clears throat> first of all, I was astonished to find out that you've come across information that John F. Kennedy removed Henry Kissinger from the White House, and that's incredibly significant right there. And then the next thing I'd like to talk about for a little while is that after the assassination, LBJ took over, and that's when the pro-Israeli government began in earnest. It was almost like a two-year-old just barely getting up on the table, and now... I hate to say it, but it's a full-grown monster, and we're in trouble. If we don't address exactly what happened, who began to take over the government? Let's see if we can talk a little bit about, bit about what happened after the assassination of JFK. Okay, well, now that you bring up Johnson, let's let's maybe start there uh, and just do a quick review. Okay, a lot of people see Lyndon Johnson getting on the radar when he got elected to Congress back in the, uh, I believe, the early or the, in the 40s. But he he had a long career before he ever got elected office. He was his his family were were big Zionist sympathizers in Texas. In fact, his aunt was in a, a Zionist organization. They always had sympathy for the Jewish cause. Lyndon Johnson was actually running guns into Palestine in the 30s. In the 30s, 1930s, yep. Lyndon B. Johnson is running guns. Along with the likes of Jack Ruby, possibly. Yep, Jack Rubenstein was also running guns into Palestine. When What do these guys get up in the morning to do? Well, apparently, one of their big things, instead of you and I going to the gym, they're loading up guns to get them to the Middle East, is what it seems. Yeah, they were, they were getting them over to the Jewish freedom fighters. So, Lyndon Johnson... You know, well, he had a big lust for power. Well, a lot of people do, but how, how was Johnson able to actually get there? Well, because of his key connections within the clandestine Jewish mafia. The kosher nostra? Pretty much, yeah. So that that's how he was able to get away with, you know, all the stuff that he got away with. People might be saying, "What? what, what is, is there any proof of this? But, all right, well, how about the USS Liberty? Is that enough proof for you right there where we have... Israeli airplanes bombing a United States, the most highly decorated ship in the United States Navy, and Israeli air fighters are bombing it at the request of Lyndon Johnson, who actually said, I want the damn ship going to the bottom of the ocean, which was a false flag to get us in a war with Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I'm no historian. Yeah, the the whole attack was going to be blamed on Egypt, so then they'd have an excuse to nuke Cairo. So they would have nuked, you know, millions of innocent people just so Israel could uh, expand its borders. And it was averted at the last moment, I believe. Like yeah. <laughs> history changed. It's hard to believe that a redneck from freaking Texas could have this much power over the, uh, millions of lives, but it appears of well, and ends. John, people look at Johnson as an entity unto his own, but really, he, he was a he was a cog in the bigger Zionist machine. That's the correct way to look at Johnson. Everybody's like, well, Lyndon, a lot of people say, well, Lyndon Johnson didn't mastermind the assassination. Yes and no, he was the key pivotal player, but he was loyal to the Zionist cause. That's what got him into position in the first place. Well, he's next in line, and we can't underestimate that. Who's going to be in charge? Him and J. Edgar Hoover were personal friends living next door to each other for 30 years. All right, and those two were as key as it gets. Yes, yeah. Um, 
Hoover, huge on the cover-up. Like, people people will say, I, I've heard people like Joan Mellon talk about the fact that Lyndon Johnson couldn't have been the point man because, you know, the cover-up rages on long after Johnson's dead. And that's that's true, but if you look at Johnson as being maybe like, say, the quarterback of the team, you know, he doesn't he didn't own the team, and he didn't even call all the plays. He just ran them on the field. That's that's how I would view Johnson. Probably that's a like, good analogy. Yeah, I, I think that's one people could, could understand. He was out there on the field. He was the guy out there throwing the ball, um, handing it off, whatever. So he wasn't Tom. He wasn't Tom Benson up in the Saints. No luxury no. suite. He well, was out on the field sweating, getting hit. In this in this analogy, the Rothschilds would be up in the owner's suite. All right. So then, wh- who would be the uh, coach? Uh, the coach. You would probably see people like Henry Kissinger. Hmm. I guess that would be a great segue into our show tonight, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why we're we're going to talk about Mr. Kissinger, and you know he's got a long career of uh, treachery and skullduggery, uh, no question about that. And he's basic; he's just a, a real disgusting human being all the way around. Oh man, it's hard to imagine. <clears throat> as far back, I was six years old when Kennedy was assassinated, but. Henry Kissinger has been around since then, and it's hard to imagine that. If you go to Google Images, this is not rocket science, type in Henry Kissinger, United States Presidents, and you will find a picture with every single one up to Obama, and you'll see Henry Kissinger, excuse me, Henry Kissinger yucking it up with LBJ, just everything's fine, and they're just having a good old time. With their legs crossed and kicked back in the chair with their ties out. The guy's been around forever, and how, how does he hang in there that long? Well, go ahead and tell us, Don. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's <laughs> there's different you know there's different theories as to how a guy like Henry Kissinger can can last this long in, in power and still still be up on TV talking you know fifty right, plus so years down the line you know. So can I, we count on you not to sugarcoat it? Well, <laughs> There's people, you know, they'll they'll say that he's drinking blood of sacrifice victims or whatever. You know, I don't know about all that. Um, I just say it, it's kind of curious, and maybe somebody uh, could really uh, that would be an area to research. I, I would, I guess, I would say. Kissinger will not go away, and it appears that Israel not, will not go away. <clears throat> Before we even get started, can you talk to us about the oath of allegiance that all politicians have to sign if they're not already a dual citizen of Israel and the United States? Yeah, Cynthia McKinney talked about that on, uh, on Stu Webb's show, and that's that's a clip I, I've got to get. I've got to I got to burn that down to an MP3. But yeah, basically what happened was she got elected and. Uh, she was going to attend a like a minority women uh, congressperson type uh, event for fundraising, and about a week before the event, I think on the fax machine it came over with APAC on the header, and uh, it was a pledge to uh, support Israel. And she she looked at it, didn't agree with what was on there, and just chucked it in the basket. And then as when it was time for the event, uh, she got a phone call and somebody asked her, "Hey, well, did you sign the pledge?" And she says, "What pledge?" And she, the the APAC, because if you don't sign that, you can't attend the fundraising events. Even a, a black, who would think that, you know, like black women in Congress, the top of their agenda would be Israel. But that's that's indeed how it plays out. Now, there's a lot of Americans that believe that this is a promise from God. It's the entire Israeli cause that seems to have everyone involved. Whether they're even aware or not. Well, I, I would say those people, the Christian Zionists, are deeply deceived. Um, I guess we, we, you know, this is not a religious show, and we'll, we'll probably talk more about that on the on the weekend, weekend report. We, yeah, down the line. Where, we'll, yeah, where there really is no holding back, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess for today's show, we're probably going to want to look at again uh, JFK, Mossad, you know, Kissinger, how all these elements kind of come together and uh yeah i saw the on henry uh, makow's website i saw the the blurb about um kissinger getting the boot right after the cuban missile crisis because kennedy kennedy looked at those generals and he he thought they were all insane and he says okay after this cuban missile crisis all right it's time to clean house and um out went uh, a bunch of them 
Yeah, they had a collective death wish for the world was his quote, if I'm not mistaken about that. He said, these men have a collective death. They just wanted to scorch Cuba. Just go ahead and burn it up and start over. That's what Curtis LeMay was screaming. It's the kind of evil we're around. And Henry Kissinger's right there among this type of evil. And if it wouldn't have been for Kennedy holding the line, New Orleans is close enough. There were nukes there, and New Orleans would be a radiation wasteland if, if they would have gotten their way. See, it's, it, it's that much evil going on here, and you have to realize how deep the evil goes, and that's what we're going to attempt to do in this show, just to realize who you're involved with and what they'll go to. They'll send a ship to the bottom of the ocean with American sailors. They do not do not care about you if you get in the way. Not, not a, Yeah, they don't care about you in the slightest. The regular working people or regular everyday people have really no concept of how evil these people are. Because there's like, okay, well, there's no way that the average person would push the button to blow up an island or a city or a country. They just, they don't have that makeup in them, you know, so they can't really understand how the power structure thinks and operates. Yeah, it's just not in our hearts, so we can't understand it because it's just not in our nature whatsoever to even think like that, much less except that someone else does. Yeah, and, well, the flip side of that is if you did think like that, if everybody thought that same way, then there would be no society because there wouldn't be anybody actually producing anything. <laughs> so there's kind of a give and take there. They, they think they're better when really it is they just have no no morality, the people at the top. They have no scruples. They have no... Uh, no feelings of remorse? No, nope, none, none whatsoever. They're, you know, I gets a lot of crap for calling them reptiles and shapeshifters, but I, I don't know how far off the mark he actually is on that, because there is everybody does have a reptilian part of their brain, it's just most of us have evolved, and the mammalian part of the brain is it plays a much bigger role, but these people seem to be just mm. pure reptile brains, That that's what... I've looked into that a little bit, and a lot of people... I've looked into it more than me, but as far as I can tell, I'd like to be, I like to have things to go on, and I just don't really have enough to go on to go there, but I do have enough to go on to know that they intermarry, and also realize that that causes a lot of problems. So we may be dealing with that. I can accept that more than um, the shape shifting and the reptilian. Yeah, the, the shape shifting, I don't know, and uh, <clears throat> as far as the reptilian, everybody's got, you know, your brain is actually, it's not one brain, it's kind of layers upon layers and the lower functioning part of the brain is is reptilian that's the part that you know that, 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 does, that does a lot of like your involuntary functions like breathing and stuff like that maybe just a bit bit higher you know is that I, and so let me at least say this the, the the individual that i know that talks about this reptilian shape-shifting stuff more than anyone else i will tell you that i know for a fact that they have reported on fake news events that have never happened. I'm saying you have to wonder how much credence you can put in someone saying something that involved and something that deep when they can't see. Let's say this Charleston shooting is a complete false flag drill. And if you can't see that, then I don't think that you're smart enough to see that deeply into the mankind. I guess what I'm referring to is, like, I, I saw a show once, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago about the effects of alcohol on the brain. So say you're just Joe Blow having a few beers after work. Well, one or two beers, you kind of feel relaxed, maybe a bit lightheaded. But, you know, the more you drink, what happens is your parts of your brain start going to sleep. So what, you know, after, like, say, five, six, seven beers, the mammalian part of your brain is basically out of it. And so then at that point, you're functioning on basically the lower part of the brain stem, they're the reptilian part. And see, I think these people at the top, they don't have much of a mammalian part of their brain at all. It's all... It's just down at the bottom yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> So if you, if you think of it in that context, then you can understand their behavior a little better. So you, you have a report for us that you put together. Do you want to get to that or you had... Sure. Yeah, on? yeah. We can we can talk about uh, Dean Henderson's article. Dean has done really really good work on on this stuff uh, with you know as far as the money, oil, Mossad, bankers. Dean's a, a really really good source for some of this stuff. 
So let's, uh, uh, let's read an excerpt here from Chapter 9 of his book, The Texas Oil Mafia, Big Oil and Their Bankers. I found this on the, uh, the nodisinfo.com website. It kind of it, it gives you a nice overview of some of these main players in, in the JFK assassination. Yeah, you seem to be better at, like you say, you don't do a lot of the preliminary research. You just put a lot of research together from different areas and have a knack for putting it all together for new information. So it is new information. However, you seem to have, you know, certain, you know, sources that you trust and go to for. Yeah, I take different pieces of the puzzle that I find and like, you try to assemble it on the table. Okay, well, this piece fits in and this piece doesn't. This might be some valid info, but maybe it doesn't fit in with what I'm trying to do now. Uh, but the Dean Henderson stuff, a lot of that is always going to fit in somewhere. So, right. so I, I like to okay, read Okay, well, let's it. roll with it. Okay, Dean's talking about Texaco insider Clint Murchison uh, had meatpacking interests in Haiti, uh, which were looked after by CIA, oh, CIA agent uh, George de uh who's also uh, in with the Mossad. He was a wealthy uh, Russian oilman and, according to the FBI, a Nazi. But I, I think in, in true... True fact, he was a Zionist. So George DeMorne Shield, Oswald's best friend in Dallas, was a Mossad. That's what it looks like, yeah. And uh, he was a spy during World War II. So he was supposedly in the white Russian community, but he was probably more in the Bolshevik Russian community. Um, yeah, and it was DeMorne Shield who drove Lee Harvey Oswald from New Orleans to Dallas days before the uh, November 22, 1963 assassination of JFK. Gaetan Fonzi, a uh, special investigator for the House Select Community, Committee on Assassinations, or the HSCA as it's commonly referred to as, was on his way to interview DeMorne Schilt in Florida regarding his role in the JFK hit uh, when the CIA agent was found with a shotgun blast through his head. Note, uh, there was no shotgun blast. No shotgun blast was heard. No entrance or exit wound. Um, his death was likely faked. Now, there was a recording of it, wasn't there? <laughs> Where they uh, heard the door open and boom. And I don't know. I don't know. Shield I, is not going to testify today. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Either either he was faked or I think, I don't know if it was actually, this is what Henderson was writing. So I don't know if it was completely faked or if, they said that he committed suicide, but I don't really buy that. Apparently the recording had footsteps and then a door slam. So I think he might have had some help departing this world. Uh, well, uh, quite a few people were helped along that were going to testify at the age yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing, yeah, like if you look at these suspicious deaths, every time there's a new government panel, <laughs> yes, yeah, there's a new panel coming, we're getting convened. There. Clearing out the witnesses in a big hurry. Yeah, that's when these that's when these start happening. So it it gets a little yeah, more. Can't say show right there. So all right, well, I guess if we're not going to go over time, I guess we better keep on cruising. Okay. Okay, so they were going through uh, uh, DeMorne Shield's uh, papers or whatever, and it says uh, in his diary, uh, one entry read, uh, Bush, George H.W., uh, Poppy, uh, uh, 1412 West Ohio, also said Zapata Petroleum Midland. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you have to laugh. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy had done plenty to piss off the U.S. military establishment. In October 1963, he pulled... 1,000 advisors out of Southeast Asia and issued uh, NSAM 363, a blueprint. I think it was actually 263, a blueprint for total Vietnam withdrawal. Uh, he sent U.S. Ambassador uh, to Guinea, uh, William Atwood, to Cuba to begin talks with Fidel Castro after publicly blasting the CIA's bungling of the Bay of Pigs operation. Kennedy said he wanted to, quote, splinter the CIA into a 1,000 pieces and scatter it to the winds, unquote and that he understood Castro's revolutionary struggle against dictator and Meyer Lansky crony Batista, who Kennedy called an incarnation of a number of sins on the part of the U.S., unquote. So Ted Shackley, Santos Traficante, and the CIA boys running Operation Mongoose, uh, which aimed to assassinate Castro, were especially outraged at Kennedy. Uh, Major General Edward Lansdale had commandeered Operation Mongoose and escalated it into a small war against Cuba. In 1955, Lansdale helped Lucien Conin set up the South Vietnamese uh, opium monopoly under uh, President uh, uh, Nguyen. Uh, the CIA continued uh, to train anti-Castro rebels in South Florida and around Lake uh, Pontchartrain outside New Orleans. Yeah, about a couple of miles from here. 
Yeah, even after Kennedy had ordered the FBI to shut down the camps, they they still kept going. So then Kennedy fired CIA director and Rockefeller cousin Alan Dulles, uh, CIA deputy director Charles uh, Cabell, whose brother was the mayor of Dallas, and CIA deputy director of plans Richard Bissell. Wait, hold on. Alan Dulles is a relative of the Rockefellers? Yeah, that's what it says. I and I, I hadn't heard that before. So again, Dean Dean's bringing us some good uh, some good info here. Man, if uh, if all this checks out, everything has changed. My goodness. Yeah, Richard Helms was Bissell's su- successor at uh, the company's Dirty Tricks Bureau, as the plan section was known. Helms was tight with James Jesus Angleton, who ran the CIA's MK Ultra mind control program for years, utilizing Mr. Mossad. Mr. Mossad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angleton was a big Mossad op, and he retired when he was all done. He went to Israel. All right, so we're talking about these people running around in CIA outfits, I guess you could say, but they're all Mossad. That's just the way it is. Am I correct about that? Yeah, uh, the CIA appears to be just a subsidiary of the Mossad. Yeah. Who's the one in Dealey Plaza? Uh, uh, it's Akrabeen. Yeah, he was there too, but also Ed Lansdale was in Dealey Plaza. Ed, Ed he Lansdale. Was Mossad. Yep. Just it was a Mossad operation going on, and yeah, they were CIA people. But if you can look at it as one and the same, then it's a it's a Mossad CIA hit. It's, it's just like um, trying to think of tuna Eastman Kodak camera. It's the same thing. Yep. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it's, all right. So sorry, I was blown away. Yeah, uh, that, that that is kind of a big bombshell. Dulles. Uh, Dulles. Yes, yeah, so the Dulles, Dulles brothers were 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 connected in tight uh, with all this stuff. Um, and all the Watergate plumbers came from an Operation Mongoose offshoot known as Operation 40. Um, uh, plumber Howard Hunt was uh, paymaster for Operation 40, which also included plumbers uh, Bernard Barker and Enterprise Liaison Raphael uh, Quintero. Uh, plumber Frank Sturgis ran the Miami-based International Anti-Communist Brigade, uh, which was funded by Santos Traficante through his Teamsters Local 320 front. Uh, the other Watergate burglars were Felipe, Diego, and Rolando uh, Martinez. Wasn't there, he a suspected shooter? Uh, there's, there's been that name bandied about. I, I'm not as up on maybe naming specific shooters as maybe That would be Dr. Fetcher's yeah. stuff. Now, if you want to find yeah. out about the shooters, Dr. Fetcher has videos where he names all six of them, and he's got a lot to back it up. I um, personally can't. Uh, I'm not convinced, but, you know, it's we have hard a right to, tell, to say that. Well, I think Harry Weatherford on top of the the Dallas County uh, building. The records building. Yeah, the records building. I, that, that's probably right. You know, but Ole Domingard also has a list of of shooters. And it, well, he's got Operation 40 going all the way yeah. up to John Lennon, if not further. Yeah, yeah. So right. between so those guys, between I'm those sorry. two guys, I would say it, that that's most likely the identity of the shooters. But, but, between Fetzer and Domigard, you can piece it together for yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's a complicated one there. I mean, you have to give it to them for at least going as far as they have, and they may have it. I'm just, uh, that's, a, that's a really, really difficult one to know. Yeah, other Watergate burglars, yeah, like the Felipe Diago and Rolando Martinez, uh, they were buddies with OSS China Hand William Polly, who owned sugar refineries in Cuba as well as the country's bus line. Hunt ran the Miami-based uh, Double Check, a CIA channel during Bay of Pigs. And Frank Sturgis physically attacked Vietnam War opponent uh, Daniel Ellsberg on the steps of the Capitol and recruited agent provocateurs to disrupt peaceful protests at the 1972 Democratic Convention. As part of Operation 40, Frank Sturgis recruited uh, Marita Lorenz to seduce Castro, then kill him. Uh, Miss Lorenz says she rode into Dallas in a vehicle loaded with weapons with Frank Sturgis, Jerry Patrick Hemming, Two Cuban exile brothers uh, named Novus and a pilot named uh, Pedro Diaz Lanz. Lorenz says they arrived arrived in Dallas the day before Kennedy was shot, uh, where they met Howard Hunt at a local hotel. He started handing out maps and money. Yep. Uh, Fletcher Prouty uh, was an Air Force intelligence officer who had been part of Kennedy's fact-finding mission, which resulted in the uh, NSAM-263 directive calling for a U.S. pullout of Vietnam. Uh, November 10, 1963, uh, Prouty's boss, Ed Lansdale, reassigned him to the South Pole on a diplomatic trip or whatever. 
escorting some VIPs. Uh, Twelve days later, Kennedy was assassinated. Prodigy swears that a photograph of Dealey Plaza on the day of the assassination shows Edward Lansdale walking away from the scene of the crime. Others have identified Howard Hunt as uh, one of the tramps who lurked in the railroad tracks behind the grassy knoll from where the fatal shot was fired. Now, Fetzer will tell you that was actually uh, Chauncey Holt. There was some confusion there over the identity of the tramp. Uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, headed Houston-based Zapata Offshore Petroleum from 56 to 64. Um, according to authors William Cooper and David Icke in 1961, Zapata got the uh, CIA into the Colombian cocaine business. Zapata's offshore oil platforms were used to transport cocaine. Well, the four horsemen shipped chemicals to Colombia necessary for production of coke. One CIA operation to invade Cuba was codenamed Operation Zapata. Uh, two Navy ships used in the attempt were named Barbara in Houston. And John Hankey's done a lot of work on that that angle. Yeah, he, he's got a mega video called Dark Legacy. It used to be JFK 2. Yep. Yeah. Millions and millions of views. As he had a mega viral hit, and he's, there are pictures of George W. Bush in, in Dealey Plaza. Two pictures, one of them right next to Ed Lansdale, and another one sitting by the building. And if the and there's no, I'm sorry, there's no question he was in Dallas. It was advertised in the paper that he was speaking at a independent oil meeting or conference of some kind. It is not disputed that George W. Bush was in Dallas, Texas that day. That's just not disputed. No. Um, and an FBI memo from Hoover dated 11-23-63 discusses briefing, quote, George Bush of CIA on the Kennedy assassination, which had occurred one day earlier. Bush was in Dallas on November 22nd. One intelligence source stated, I know Bush was involved in the Caribbean. I know he was involved in the suppression of things after the Kennedy assassination. In a 1973 interview uh, published in the Atlantic Monthly, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, himself a Texas oil man and Zionist sympathizer, hinted at a conspiracy on that gloomy day in Dallas and talked of a murder incorporated being run by the CIA out of the Caribbean. Johnson was referring to Permindex, uh, the permanent industrial exhibitions, as an assassination bureau run by the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, of Britain's MI6. According to a book published by um, Executive Intelligence Review, which is part of the LaRouche organization, called Dope, Inc., the book that drove uh, Kissinger crazy, Permindex was funded by the Canadian Bronfman family and wealthy Polish uh, solidaritist uh, Radzowell uh, family. Permindex leader, uh, MI6, SOE, uh, Colonel William, intrepid uh, Stephenson, Stephenson, had earlier deployed the uh, Meyer Lansky crime syndicate and helped uh, rehabilitate Lucky Luciano. SOE Colonel Louis Bloomfield was an OSS veteran and Bronfman liaison who chaired Permindex since its 1958 founding in Montreal and uh, Geneva. SOE and Permindex insider General Julius Klein ran guns to the murder, murderous Haganah uh, when the Zionists seized Israel from the, from the Palestinians. He handles uh, Buffalo mob boss Max Fisher and Carl Lindner at uh, United Brands, uh, whose banana boats, according to DEA, regularly ship cocaine to the U.S. Uh, other SOE members include uh, David Sarnoff, who was RCA conglomerate at the time, uh, formed the core of the U.S. National Security Agency, and Walter Sheridan, who provided intelligence to Resorts International and fugitive financier uh, Robert Vesco. Uh, the most familiar member of SOE was Colonel Clay Shaw, whose son of uh, same name is a Florida congressman serving on a House Narcotics uh, Task Force. Talking about the same Walter Sheraton that thwarted yep. Jim Garrison's investigation? Yep. Okay. So they're it's all coming about, together, isn't it? Well, here comes, here's our guy Clay Shaw popping up again. Uh, Shaw was an OSS veteran who later became director of the New Orleans International Trademark, uh, the U.S. subsidiary of Permindex. <clears throat> Shaw was indicted in 1969 for his role in the Kennedy assassination by New Orleans attorney Jim Garrison. During the trial, 17 key prosecution witnesses died Garrison became the target of a smear campaign. That continues to this very day. Yep. Shaw served under uh, Stevenson for 20 years in, in World War II, uh, 
where he had been OSS liaison to Winston Churchill. SOE operatives, operatives and infiltrated the FBI and formed Division 5, a British intelligence fifth column which was headed by Bloomfield. Both Bloomfield and Shaw were present at a series of meetings in Montego Bay, Jamaica, 1963. The meetings were held at Tyndall Compound, uh, built by uh, Sir William Stevenson, to serve British intelligence interests in the Caribbean after World War II. Stevenson had launched Brenco, an energy exploration firm financed by the Oppenheimer's family, uh, family's uh, Rio Tinto. Uh, he moved to Jamaica in 1949 and set up the British American Canadian Corporation with financing from UK merchant um, banking giant Hambros. It was Stevenson who helped Alan Dulles uh, stash the Hitler and uh, Gerbil trusts and Swiss bank accounts after World War II. Now he presided over Montego Bay meetings where, according to many uh, Kennedy assassination researchers, JF the JFK hit was planned. So I, I have heard that as well, that it was uh, uh, the worldwide Jewish uh, Congress? Yeah, Congress that was actually issued the, the order for the hit on Kennedy. Well, the Prime Minister Ben-Gurion resigning over Kennedy being a threat to the state of Israel had to have something to do with it. Uh, yeah, he was in there. I, I don't think that Ben-Gurion actually issued the the order for the hit. I think it came from above him. The, uh, well, Fetcher, Fetcher says he resigned while, so, so he wouldn't be Prime Minister during the assassination. I, I think Ben-Gurion played a large role in it. I do, too. I don't think he actually issued the hit order, but I think he was on board with it. Um, well, your official reason for stepping down as president, which is no small thing. It's not like you're going to step down from Popeye's or McDonald's. And because one man is a threat to, I guess, what everything's about, the state of Israel. Yep. That's a big clue right there, everyone. Pay attention. Don't just let that glaze you over. Um, those present at the meetings included... Uh Frank Nagy, uh, World War II cabinet minister in the pro-Hitler Horthy government of Hungary, uh, who later became Hungarian prime minister. Giorgio Montello, a Romanian emigre, uh, who served as Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's trade minister. Um, Paul uh, Regardarsky, a Russian solidarity leader. And uh, Jean de Menil, an old money European aristocrat, Russian president of Slumber J, uh, the giant oil industry service uh, provider and frequent CIA arms conduit based in uh, uh, Homa, Louisiana. Right. Yep. When I was a child, my father used to take me to that particular base, and that's where E. Howard Hunt and everybody else were actually broke in and stole a stash of weapons because Slumber J would go offshore and service wells, but they'd also go offshore and bring guns. So they were just as deep in it. And in fact, my father would bring me to this place, and the guns were just feet away from me as I played with my G.I. Joe. Yep. And all President Tyndall uh, were executives of Permindex, whose board members included uh, Roy Cohn, former general counsel to Senator Joe McCarthy, uh, Montreal crime boss uh, Joe Bonanno, Mussolini Agriculture Minister, uh, Count Gutierrez, Di Spedor, De Fora, the Italian House of Savoy, Habsburg and Little Spock family bankers, Hans Siegelman of Basel, Carlo D'Amelio, a Rome attorney for the houses of Savoy, and King Farouk of Egypt's uncle. Let's see, so, so many executives at, at present the Tyndall were executives of Permindex, and Permindex was a uh, front for uh, Nazi International. Uh, Colonel uh, Louis Bloomfield was a partner at Phillips, Weinberg, Bloomfield, and Goodman, attorneys for the uh, Canadian Bronfman family. In 1968, the firm was forced to delete Bloomfield's name from its letterhead when French President Charles de Gaulle publicly exposed Bloomfield for his role in the assassination attempt on de Gaulle. De Gaulle named uh, Credit Suisse of uh, Geneva as financer of Bloomfield's attempt to push and traced its origins to NATO headquarters in Brussels. Permindex was forced to move out of Europe to fascist-friendly uh, South Africa. Simultaneously, de Gaulle kicked uh, the Israeli Mossad out of France due to its cozy relations with Permindex. 
Uh, Credit Suisse Canada has been identified by some researchers as the uh, SOE paymaster for the Perm Index assassination of JFK, which was accomplished after Stevenson set up an operations command center at David Sarnov's RCA building at New York's Rockefeller Center. Uh, Bloomfield worked under the cover of Israeli Continental Corporation and the Canadian subsidiary of Heineken Breweries. Uh, he controlled the Iran uh, Histerud charity, which constitutes 33% of Israel's GNP. And Bank Napolim, Israel's second largest bank and favorite Mossad conduit. Uh, Bloomfield was director of the Israeli uh, Canadian Maritime League and served as Canadian Consul General in Liberia. Uh, there he worked with uh, the only other foreign diplomat in Monrovia, Bank de Credit Internationals, or BCI, Tibor Rosenbaum, and establishing Liberia's status as an offshore banking center and in making Liberia's flag available to international shippers uh, who wish to disguise their true country of origin. The Liberian flag has been well utilized uh, by drugs and arms smugglers. Uh, Bloomfield was also chairman of the Red Cross Ambulance Service, a post traditionally held uh, by, by the top knight in Queen Elizabeth uh, II's modern-day roundtable, most venerable military and uh, hospi- hospital order, order of uh, St. John of Jerusalem. Though known more for its charitable side, uh, which includes uh, selling donated blood for around $100 a pint, uh, the Red Cross is officially an intelligence arm of the British monarchy. And according to Dope Inc., Tibor Rosenbaum's BCI was a key bank in the Perm Index assassination of Kennedy, transferring funds from uh, Bank Hopalim in uh, New Orleans FBI Division 5 uh, Station Chief Guy Bannister as a means of laundering and preventing any connection to the European and uh, Canadian players including Bronfman handlers, uh, the Oppenheimers, and Rothschilds. Uh, Bannister's agent, uh, Jerry Brooks, uh, Gatlin doled out the cash to Hunt and his uh, Cuban team of assassins. Uh, Both Bannister and Gatlin died under mysterious circumstances. Uh, Howard Hunt's uh, double check was a subsidiary of uh, Central Mondial Commercial, a Rockefeller entity, um, another name for the WTC, the World Trade Center, and the Perm Index uh, Rome branch. Uh, William Seymour, uh, the Oswald double who played uh, a Cuban sympathizer for months before the Kennedy hit, met with Clay Shaw and David Ferry to form a, a triangulation fire plan. Uh, the actual Oswald uh, was on SOE Division 5 payroll. And according to many researchers, the weapons for the Kennedy coup came through a Slumber J, and the seven-shooter hit team consisted of an elite group put together by J. Edgar Hoover and Sir William Stevenson in 1943. The team was formed through the American Council of Christian Churches, uh, the ACCC, which Bloomfield, Stevenson, and Hoover founded as a cover for U.S. and British intelligence via ACCC. Uh, Latin American missions. Uh, ACCC is a network of aristocratic far-right religions. Uh, Its West Coast director, E.E. Bradley, was indicted by New Orleans prosecutor Jim Garrison for his role in the JFK hit. Uh, David Ferry worked under uh, ACCC cover, um, an ACCC orphan school near uh, Pueblo, Mexico. Uh, Note, Ferry was a pedophile and homosexual, and uh, the uh, the orphan school was used to train uh, 25 to 30 of the world's premier marksmen. Uh, ACCC Minister uh, Albert Osborne ran the school after he fled the U.S. due to his support of Hitler during World War II. Um, These students carried out the Kennedy assassination. Assassins from this same team may have well been deployed to kill both Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Um, Kennedy was scheduled to speak at the Dallas Trademark, which was a Perm Index affiliate, the day he was gunned down. Uh, after the Kennedy assassination, Perm Index morphed into uh, 
uh, Intertel, while BCI was uh, replaced by Robert Vesco's Bahamas-based uh, Resorts International, whose lawyers included uh, Paul Hallowell and Kennedy Justice Department hack Robert Pelican, uh, who served in Naval Intelligence and with NSA before uh, joining the uh, Justice Department. Uh, Resorts International has its headquarters on Paradise Island, which is owned by Huntington Hartford, a ski on of the uh, Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Uh, Intertel is officially a subsidiary of Resorts, and its board included Howard Hunt, buddy uh, Edward Mullen of FBI Division 5, and president of the Bronfman family controlled Royal Bank of Canada, uh, David Belial of NSA, and Sir Randolph Bacon. Former head of Scotland Yard, Intertel provides security for uh, Caribbean and Las Vegas casinos and moved gambling and horse racing operations to Atlantic City, New Jersey. <laughs> the Warren Commission, which investigated, uh, air quotes there, the Kennedy assassination was stacked with uh, the very cronies Kennedy had denounced, uh, Alan Dulles, uh, the CIA director whom Kennedy had fired, loomed large over the proceedings, uh, steering the inquiry away from any hint of CIA involvement. FBI Director uh, Hoover was a right-wing fanatic who despised Kennedy. Uh, President Gerald Ford, uh, then a Michigan senator, leaked information on the hearings to FBI Assistant Director Cartha uh, DeLoach. Uh, senators Arlen Specter and Richard Shelby are prominent members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which oversees CIA activity. Uh, but the most influential member of the Warren Commission was Chase Manhattan Bank Chairman John McCloy, who later directed the World Bank. Uh, McCloy was attorney for the Saudi-based Aramco and helped David Rockefeller uh, spirit the Shah out of Iran. Um, and then uh, no disinfo it says, uh, no, this is the, the most important of uh, Henderson's assessment. Uh, the most influential proving that the Rockefeller cabal was the secret American force behind the assassination. So I, I think what we're seeing is, and, and the Rockefellers are widely known as a front for the Rothschilds, so I think if you, if you trace the Kennedy players up the food chain far enough, I think it's going to lead to the uh, doorstep they're all, of the Rothschilds. They're all, yeah, they're all on the Warren Commission. It yeah, just dawned on me that the answer to the perpetrators are right there in the Warren Commission with a couple of schmucks brought in like Hale Bob. Yeah, it, it's, it was all, yeah, it was all flunkies. From the perm index, you know, the Zionist wing of the, the banking cabal. So really, who did Kennedy? So who had the power? Anybody can shoot somebody, but who's got the power to run the cover-up for 50-plus years? You know, who owns the media? Who does Henry Kissinger work for? Yeah. But I guess we didn't even really get into Kissinger like we should. I guess we'll have to have a second well, part of our show. Yeah, there's... Uh, he, he keeps his name out of it, but he, he is sneaking around in there, and... Uh, We'll we'll do more work on it, but yeah, he does pop up with perm index, although there is kind of scant info available about that. But but Mr. Kissinger was involved with perm index, and as we can see, perm index uh, was really the the key. Yeah, that that's really kind of the infrastructure for the uh, the assassination. That's where the money was flowing to and fro, the weapons, the assassins. It was the kind money. of all. Yep. Yeah, the trademark was part of perm index. Uh, the World Trade Center. So once you study, you know, JFK and 9-11 to any, you know, serious extent, you're going to see a lot of the same players. There you go. All right, well, I guess we're going to have to close it for now, Don Fox. So we'll take on part two for next week. You right? You up for that? Lord willing, we'll, uh, right. we'll tackle it. All right. All right, Don. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. You bet. We'll talk to you later, Gary.